Okay, so a couple of days ago I was at a math conference and I volunteered to participate in a study of math education and I was given a couple of things to, uh, on the spot, how would you explain this to a fourth grader, fifth grader? And so one of the things I was asked to explain is why if you have a fraction, if you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same thing, it's the same fraction. So in some sense this will lead to my favorite proof of the Pythagorean formula. And in terms of, you know, why do we care, you know, there should hopefully be lots of applications of the Pythagorean formula. The most basic of why we care about Pythagoras is it's a really good measure of distance. Okay. If you want to know how far apart something is, the Pythagorean formula, well, if I have two points, I draw the triangle connecting them, the hypotenuse is the square root of the sum of the squares. As a Bostonian, for the most part, I hate New York City, but I do have to say, at least a subset of New York City does something better than Boston. The grid. The grid. Manhattan. Manhattan has a much better street system than Boston. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you know, I know we're in Cambridge and not Boston, but you can explore the beauty of Massachusetts streets you know, later today. Well, we have back pay. You have back pay, yes, <laughs> which is not a bay anymore. <laughs> but uh, one of the interesting uh, fun jokes I've heard about the Pythagorean theorem is imagine you are caught and accused of selling drugs. Okay, hopefully this is a hypothetical. Hopefully you don't have to, oh yeah, I remember Steve when that happened. Okay. So if you are caught or accused of selling drugs, what could make your punishment even worse? You're close to a school. So you want to make sure that if you're selling drugs, you're not too close to a school. If you're within a certain distance, the penalty is higher. How do you measure distance to school? Well, that's the thing is, you know, if you do as the bird flies, it's one way. If you do as you walk, you know, if you're in Manhattan, you can't just walk through the buildings, bus routes and whatnot. And so, you know, this is almost surely a joke, but the story is told of somebody who was caught and was trying to say, I should not be tried with the harsher possible penalty because, you know, yes, I'm within 1,000 feet as the crow flies, but I'm actually, you know, 1,100 feet if you go on city blocks. So in terms of people who are looking for a fun application of Pythagoras, you can of course try to come up with better phrasing than this. <laughs> but you know, the real thing is we want to figure out distance between objects. You know, how far apart is something? And this is one of the most basic quantities we have. And this is a really good way to get that. Okay, so the question was, why is 2 thirds equal to 4 sixths? And so I was told I'm teaching this to either fourth graders or fifth graders with no preparation, just go, how would I give the lecture? And so my first thought was, you know, basically to use pizza. You know, look for some kind of visual prompt. And then I have two different pizza proofs. You can tell me, okay, yeah, if you have a good imagination, this is a pizza. So, you know, here's, you know, pizza, and I have two out of three slices. And one possibility, one proof is I take my pizza and I cut each slice in half. And so here I have two out of three slices and here I have four out of six slices. And physically I have the same amount of pizza in both. You know, the fraction of the pie that I have is the same here as here. So the two-thirds is the same as the four-sixths, and this is equivalent to multiplying everything by two. I'm doubling the number of objects. So that was proof one. Proof two was the following. Is, you know, here again is my two-thirds, and then I add another pizza where I have two-thirds. And if I now count how many pieces I have, I now have four out of six. And since both of these have, you know, two-thirds of the pie, at the end of the day, I still have to have two-thirds of the pie. What I'm really excited about is a lot of you are much closer to teaching fourth graders than I am. Which method do you think would be better for fourth graders? I'm hoping at least one of them is good. I think the first one is better. I think the first one as well. Mm -hmm. So what is the difficulty here? We have more pizza there. So yeah, That's bad. So what we're really doing, which we've changed the notion of the whole. 
And again, this is one of the dangers sometimes when you read things by professional mathematicians is we often do not put ourselves right into the mindset of who we're looking at. And so here for me, it's clear, oh, I've got two-thirds, I've got two-thirds, I've got two-thirds of the whole unified double pizza. But you know, from the perspective of somebody who's just learning the subject, in some sense, we're taking an average of two fractions. That's what Four six. Two thirds and two thirds. Well, no, I mean, oh, yes, I yes. Mean, yes. Probably, you know, 10 plus 5 is 3. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Three yes. Seven. And so if you look at the, yes, and so if you look at the amount of pizza, yeah. right? So, you know, to me, I think this way is a little bit harder, but I think there's some nice things about this. One of the things that I have to give, you know, hats off to the chemists and the biologists and the physicists is they are really good about units and labeling. Mathematicians, we are often careless. And I remember getting into trouble in a math class. I was taking complex analysis, and the professor wrote down the answer for an integral with you know, free parameter. And I raised my hand and said, you know, the answer is wrong. The units don't match. I was what? Sorry, I'm not in my physics class. I'm in. The degree of homogeneity in the input variable is not Oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> and so, but to me, I was trained as a physicist as well, and I put in units. And if I'm integrating things, if I'm doing these things, I have units. What should the units of my answer be? There are units going on here. This 2 and this 4, they're not quite the same. I would view this as two big slices over three big slices. And I might view this as four small slices over six small slices. Because here, is 2 plus 2 equal to 4? If I take two of these big slices and take two more of those big slices, is that the same as the four small slices? No. And so there's so many chances to be confused or to gloss over key points. And you know, for me, a lot of times I want to use things as a springboard. Now, when you're teaching fourth graders, it's damn important, as somebody who teaches them calculus years later, for them to understand what fractions are. <laughs> so you know, that definitely has to be on the table. But at the same time, I want them seeing the bigger picture. And then what I'm doing here is two out of three. It's really two big out of three big. This is really four small out of six small. There was a wonderful story, depending on your point of view, I mean, it's very sad, but it leads to really good examples of a NASA probe that became a $25 million crater on Mars. How many of you, any of you hear of this? All of the systems were in the metric, except for one subcontractor who thought things would be coming in the English system. Yeah, so they miscalculated how much thrust they needed when they were landing, and instead of having a probe land on Mars, you now have a crater. And you just you see them watching a machine. It's going a little fast, isn't it? And so, you know, the... Oh, it is, it is, when you're calculating things and just having a sense of what the unit should be. So this is three big total, and I have two big out of three big. So there's a unit lurking in the background. And so to me, I am a huge fan of unit analysis. You know, I like the second approach here. What's nice about here is I always have the same units for every calculation. This is four big over six big. And percentage-wise, it's the same as 2 big over 3 big. But it's not referring to the same concept now. This is talking about, you know, as fractions, they're equal. Here, the physical amount is equal. And so, you know, again, as you go higher and higher in mathematics, you forget about the stuff you did earlier and earlier, and it becomes second nature. And, you know, to me, I like stuff like this because it's, you know, flags for me when I'm lecturing. I've got to be very careful for people who are just seeing a concept for the first time. You know, what are the subtleties? There's a unit problem going on here. So before proving Pythagoras, I thought I would prove a wonderful formula from physics. Or almost prove. I'll, I'll come close. How many of you have ever seen you know, pendulum swinging? So this is one of the most famous problems you know, in you know, high school physics labs is you have a pendulum, and you want to calculate what is the period as a function of the different things in play. So we have our pendulum here. It's swinging. And let's think of all the different stuff we have that can come into play. So we have the force of gravity. Uh, uh, not with that pen. Right. 
we have gravity. and g, and this is in meters per second squared. So this is the acceleration due to gravity. What else do we have in play for the problem? In the vacuum. Well, it's in a vacuum. Okay. Length, of the rod. length of the rod. So this is length in meters. We, okay, we have the mass. And we'll do that in kilograms. So we, we, can, we can put in some kind of angle here. And what's the units of the angle? Radians. 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 So it's 2 pi radian. <laughs> But, but, why, but why are radians better? A, because you can do calculus in them. But why? What, what allows you, what's the... You're dealing with fractions. Because they're essentially unitless. But, but degrees are... Degrees always leave the degree there. Radians are essentially unitless. So if I want to do like an arc length, it's just radians times the length of the radius. It eliminates this conversion factor. And when you use radians, the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. If you use degrees, you have a factor of 360 over 2 pi that you have to play with. So when we want to try to understand what's going on, this is a little bit more, yeah. Pi over 2. So the circle has 2 pi radians. And the thing that's nice about it is if you have a circle of radius 1, the, the perimeter of a circle of radius 1 is 2 pi. And you have 2 pi radians. So if I ask you, you know, here is a given arc, the length of this angle in radians is actually the same as the length of the corresponding arc. If I had a circle of radius r, there would be just a, a fact of r to scale from one to the other. So it, it makes a lot of the calculations simpler to have this. Yes. Yes. And then there are a couple of people um, that, which is, which is the real constant? Is it pi or is it 2 pi? And so 2 pi is often called tau. And so some people say 2 pi is the fundamental constant, not pi. That it's more things that come up in terms of length. If you take complex analysis, length comes in more than uh, area. If you go to some things in physics, if you go to electricity and magnetism, you have normalization constants like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And the 4 pi is coming from the surface area of the sphere. So I've yet to find somebody who argues we should do 4 pi and not 2 pi. But you know, to play devil's advocate, I will put you know, 4 pi in the ring once we start going there. And then now that we have all of this stuff, we might as well go with pi because it's the most basic multiple from which all comes. Because now, now we've got 2 pi, 4 pi, you know, we've got too many things. So let's say we want to calculate the period. What are the units for the period? You know, how long it takes to go back and forth? Seconds. So I'm going to be completely vague as to whether or not you have to go all the way back and forth. Probably back and forth. But the main thing is it's going to be in seconds. So it, it should be back and forth. But you know, what really matters is how we choose to define a period, a half period. This could come into play with swimmers. You know, you're doing laps in a pool. Is a lap going all the way back and then coming back to where you started, or is it just going the length of the pool? If you do the length of the pool, you, you look like you're doing twice as many. And so I, I know a lot of. And so I know I, I think a lap should be back and forth, and a length should be just one direction. But you know. Depending on how you define things, normally period is you come all the way back to where you started. So let's try to write the period as a function of all this stuff. So before we even go to the lab, can we get a sense of what the answer should be? And this is one of the things that I'm a strong supporter of. What do you think? Do some work before you gather the data and get a sense of what the answer should look like. How do you guess one thing? I even with little kids, right. fractions, what do you think your answer should look like? Right. You have to force them. And just. 
<laughs> you actually, well, the, the, in the copious amounts of time you have as a teacher, you know, you have plenty of time to dwell on things that will not be tested by the assessment people. You, you can give them four choices and ask, you know, which one do you think? But when we start looking at things, you know, here are the units we have. We have uh, meters per second squared. We have radians. We have meters. And we have kilograms. And somehow from all of this, we have to get a unit of seconds. Which things will be in play, which things will not be in play? Is there anything that has to be involved? Meters per second squared better be involved because this is the only way we're going to get seconds. So if we don't have meters per second squared, we're dead. Okay. So we know we at least need that. I'm just worried about how the, the sun is going. Okay. All right. So we know we need at least that. What about radians? They're unitless. Damn, we've got to worry about radians. Okay. What about meters? It seems reasonable because we've got meters per second. So if this is coming in, meters, sure, fair game. What about kilometers? Kilograms. Kilograms, sorry. Kilograms, sorry. <laughs> what about... It's not really that because it can't cancel anything. There's nothing that can cancel the kilogram. So before we do any experiments, we have a conjecture. If we double the mass of the pendulum bob, it's not going to affect the period. If we triple the mass of the pendulum bob, it's not going to affect the period. Without doing any calculations... And so it's wonderful if you can then have the students not just doing the lab, but trying to, on their own, figure out what the answer could be. All right, so now, how can we get seconds from these things? The radians can be just floating around. You know, there's nothing we can do about that. I'll just call it some function f of theta. I have no idea what it is. It's just something is there involving the angle. It turns out it's always going to be 2 pi, and the answer is independent of the angle, but we have no way of knowing that. What's the only relationship we can have between G and L? I need to get seconds. OK, so it's going to be a square root. L over G. And that coefficient is, the, is going to just be the thing that depends on theta. It turns out that this is either 2 pi or 1 over 2 pi. I forget which way it goes. But without going into the lab now, we have two conjectures. Conjecture 1, the answer is independent of the mass. Conjecture two, if I quadruple the length, the period should be twice as much. And so this is just dimensional analysis. So. And then you get video from the museum of science. Yep. Well, hopefully you even do it yourself and just have you know, the pendulum swinging. But before you do any experiments, you have an idea of what to expect. And now the question is trying to figure out, ah, the real difficulty is going to be how, th how things change as we vary theta. So if I only have a certain amount of time in the lab, do I want to do, do I want to vary theta more, or do I want to vary L more, or do I want to vary M more? Well, M not at all. I mean, to some extent, maybe L and M are playing roughly the same game. Because, I mean, I already know exactly how things should be varying with L. So maybe I want to keep everything fixed and just worry about changing theta. It's the easiest thing to change. It's also very easy to change. Exactly. Whereas, you know, I, I didn't have to you know, lengthen the rod. Right. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is this is in the idealized world. There's no you know, resistance to the ear. Well, there is a resistance due to the ear. And maybe that's going to be dependent on the mass. You know, maybe the resistance force depends on the mass. Uh, maybe it depends on the length, you know, this, because of the angle things are making. So the problem can get very complicated very fast. That's why you just do it in a vacuum. Much easier. <laughs> so this is one of the nice examples of doing dimensional analysis. What I want to do now is I want to go from this to Pythagoras, you know, to proving the Pythagorean formula. So hopefully everyone has seen this before. So Williams College has many claims to fame. One of the ones that probably is not that high on people's radar screen is I believe we are the only institution to graduate somebody to both become president of the United States of America and to be given credit for an original proof of the Pythagorean formula. Garfield. Garfield. So he died. Great uh, proof, too. Oh, I mean, I, I love it. 
I, I, I have to say his proof is highly derivative of other proofs. It's a nice proof. It's a nice proof. Uh, I know I'm supposed to like his proof Very more. It's, it is simple. Um, I think his proof is derivative of a trapezoidal proof, but it's still, it's still nice. Uh, so Pythagoras. So Pythagorean formula. I think the most common way is a squared plus b squared is c squared, where you have a right triangle like this. So again, this is one of the building block results in all of mathematics. You know, extremely important. Allows us to get notions of distance. There's lots of different proofs of it. So before going to the dimensional analysis proof, I'll give two of the standard proofs. So let's take a rectangle, I'm uh, sorry, a square, and let's say I'm making B the shorter side. Okay, so here's A, here's B, here's B, here's A, here's B, here's A. I'm not even trying to do this carefully, so it won't. I need a little piece first. And so B and A. And then these will all be C. These are all right angles. Are there any other right angles? Yeah. If this is 90, if this angle is x, this angle is y, the complementary, if this is, so if I fill this in, if this is x, this is y, this is x, x plus y plus 90 is 180, x plus y, oh, I need to add in 90 over here. And by symmetry, they'll all be the same. There's lots of different ways you can show. So I have a square. So we're going to assume we know that the area of a square or a rectangle is just length times height. If I have a right triangle, it's half of a rectangle. So we will assume that we know the area of right triangles is just one half base times height. So it's again, what am I assuming? What do we start with? If I give you a generic triangle, what is the area? That's a hard problem. This is either here or Heron's formula, depending on, you know, do you have enough budget to put in the end with all that ink? But Regular right triangles, not bad. So let's calculate the area two different ways. One way is it's a plus b squared, which is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. Another way is I have four triangles, and each one is 1 half ab, plus I have a small square, which is c squared. So I get c squared plus 2ab. Well, they've got to be the same, so therefore a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And you know, this is you know, a proof of the Pythagorean formula. There's lots and lots of different proofs you can find as you, know, you pick things up and you rearrange things. It's always a question of, you know, how did you think of doing it like this? You know, that's the hardest you know, problem in all of these different geometry proofs. So for a long time, this was my favorite proof. But the one I'm going to show you now is my favorite proof. And it's my favorite proof because it has a really good math idea behind it. And this is really the thinking like a mathematician's. This is supposed to be one of the moments, oh my, I never looked at it that way before. OK. So let's consider right triangles, A, B, C. For those of you who teach Geometry, do you normally use x as the variable for the angle? Theta. You use theta? OK. So we use theta. So the area of the triangle, and we're going to use a little bit of functional notation. It's going to be a function of various things. <coughs> One way to get the area of the triangle is it's a function of a and b. Right? So we'll call it um, f of a and b. Now, we actually know what that function is. What's that function? One half AB. So we don't need to know this, but we know what it is. It's also a function of C and theta. 
And so I'll use a different letter, G of C and theta. Anybody know what the area is as a function of C and theta? We're not going to use it in the proof. This is just, do you happen to know what that answer would be? Good. So over here, A is the same as C cosine theta. B is the same as C sine theta. So it's going to be 1 half C squared uh, sine theta cosine theta. And if you want to impress people with your trig, it's 1 fourth C squared sine of 2 theta. If you want to simplify things and combine things. Okay. So again, if I know all of this stuff, that's wonderful. But let's see if we can sniff out a little bit of the form of g of c theta. If I double c, what do you think happens to the area? Four times. If I triple c, what happens to the area? Nine times. So this is using CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So if I increase, if I dilate c by r, so I start off with a triangle like this, where this is c, and now I increase to now this is r times c. Well, if this was b, now this whole side is r times b. And if this is a, this whole side is now r times a. So that's all I need to know. I don't, know, I don't need to know how it depends on theta. I don't need to know sines and cosines. I just need to know that if I double C, the area quadruples. If I triple C, it increases by a factor of 9. So we know that this function g of c theta has to be some other function, h of theta times c squared. And again, you can think about how many different functions do you want to put in, but this whole idea of your know, function tells you how something changes with respect to inputs. You give me some inputs, the function tells you what the output is. And depending on what I know, I can break my complicated function up into simpler things. So for me, I know algebra, I was talking with some people before class, is often forgotten by people as they go through geometry. Ways to try to remind people of their algebra as they're doing the geometry. To me, this is a good thing. And so here's a way to remind people and talk about why we care about functions. Why do we give functions names? We give things names when we use them again and again. We can sniff out some of the relationship. You know, how do things change as I change c? It's got to be proportional to c squared. And you know, if you want, uh, the simplest way to see this is I can write this as g of c times 1. And so, you know, Imagine you have a hypotenuse of length 1, angle theta, and I increase the hypotenuse by dilating by a factor of c, so that now the hypotenuse is a factor, is now just length c. So in that case, it's really just uh, c squared g of uh, 1 comma theta. So really, if you want, and this is really algebra overkill, which I would not want to do in a class, the function h of theta is just the function g, where you always take c to be 1. So the main idea is we have this relationship that the area of the triangle is proportional to the square of the hypotenuse. There's some proportionality constant, which may depend on the angle. So the first thing you can, what's the first thing you should ask your students? You've know, got this function h of theta. We just did the pendulum, and in the pendulum it was constant. What do you think would be a good question here? Are the units? One of the units. So this will, that's a good question that will be very important later. I would say this is unitless. Just depends on the radians. What do you want to know about this function h of theta? How is it changing? So what would be the easiest value of theta to put in? The easiest value is 0, 45. So you could calculate you know, theta equals 0, 45 degrees. Um, we could do 30 degrees. We could do 90 degrees. 
60 degrees. You could put in a couple of values here if you want to get a sense, and you'll see that theta changes. If theta is 0, my area is going to be 0. As theta goes to pi halves, you know, I'm getting you know, shorter and shorter, the area is also going to go to 0. The area is going to be large, at 45 degrees. We can calculate its value at a few different things. The point is that we can see very easily, ugh, this function h of theta varies. It's not the simplest function to look at. Okay? So we are one idea away from a proof of Pythagoras. And all we're using is that the area of the triangle is proportional to the hypotenuse squared. And the proportionality depends on this angle. We don't know what that angle is. Uh, is, th is there a question? Or? Oh, I'm not keeping the same area. I'm keeping the same hypotenuse. So I'm keeping C fixed. And as I keep C fixed, as I change theta, you know, imagine I have a ladder. I have a ladder against a wall. And you know, as the ladder falls down, as the ladder goes up, you're using like a ladder image is a great way. You can see that the area under the ladder is going to change. And you might think A and B are both going to change. So. Exactly. So if I keep C fixed, like a ladder falling, you know, starting uh, vertically and then falling like this, I go from zero area to some point maximum area and then back down to zero. By symmetry, it seems reasonable to expect maximum is going to be at 45 degrees. Can you follow along where these two squares? Why do you conclude that you can separate these? So th this is one of the two key observations. So we saw that if we dilate by a factor of r, we increase the area by a factor of r squared. And the nice way to see this is if I increase c by a factor of r, I increase a and b by factors of r. And we know the area is just 1 half ab. So the area now would be increased by a factor of r squared. So if I double c, I double a, I double b, the area increases by a factor of 4. If I triple c, I triple a, I triple b, the area increases by a factor of 9. So the area is going to be proportional to the hypotenuse squared. And if you want to be you know, really pedantic, you can say, I'm going to write the hypotenuse not as c, but as c times 1. I'm going to dilate 1 by a factor of c. And so my dilation factor is now c, so I've now changed my area by c squared. So it's now the area of a triangle with angle theta and hypotenuse 1 scaled by a factor of c squared. Does that make? So this is one of the two key observations. And you know, it's coming down to area. You know, if I'm talking about area, area is meters times meters. c squared is the right unit for meters. What is the key thing you do in almost every good geometry proof? At some point in the proof, you have to do what? Modeling. I'm sorry? Modeling. This is modeling it, but usually when they give you something, they don't give you everything you need. Right, and what's one of the key steps you do? This is, the, this is what I think is the hardest thing for students to do on their own when they're giving something in geometry that they have to prove. You have to pick a path to follow and see if that works. Okay, and how? I, I know this is a vague question. It's, it's tough to say the question without telling you what I want you to say. <laughs> substitute? Not substitute. You have to draw an not a conclusion, an auxiliary line. Right? Usually, when you're given a problem, you have to start adding in additional lines, and you have to start factoring in and pulling in different information. And normally, what they give you is enough to solve the problem, but you need to put in additional lines and start doing the calculations. We saw that when we did the square a moment ago. You know, I had the x and then the y, and then we had the supplementary angles and the complementary angles and all that stuff to figure out what the different things were, and the knowledge propagated. What I find when I talk to students about geometry, the hardest thing to answer is, where do you draw the line? Where do you put in this auxiliary line? Why do you put it here and not someplace else? And so in doing all this stuff here, we want to draw an auxiliary line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw the triangle a little bit larger. So here's A, here's B, here's C. And I want to draw an auxiliary line. And we're trying to calculate areas of right triangles. 
what would be a really good place to draw an auxiliary line? Why? Excellent. Right. The whole point is we're trying to study right triangles. So if I'm going to draw an auxiliary line, why not draw a line that gives me more right triangles? So if this angle down here is theta, what's the angle over here? 90 minus theta. And this is 90 minus theta over here. And what's the angle over here? Theta. I now have three triangles. I have, and I have very unoriginal names, I have triangle one, triangle two, and then big triangle. The area of the big triangle is the sum of the areas of the smaller triangles. And what wonderful property do all these small triangles have? They all have an angle of theta in them. And we've just shown that area is proportional to the angle times hypotenuse squared. So now we can use that to calculate the area of these three triangles. So area of 1, what is the hypotenuse of triangle 1? A. So we get h of theta times a squared. What's the area of 2? What's its hypotenuse? B. And what's its angle? It's a theta. Now what's nice is we immediately have by symmetry that if you have angle theta or 90 minus theta, they're the same. h of theta is the same as h of 90 minus theta. But it doesn't really matter. We can always use this as our angle theta. It's also going to be h of theta times b squared. An area of the whole, what is that? h of theta times c squared. So these two must equal the third. So we get h of theta a squared plus h of theta b squared is h of theta c squared. We have to be just a little bit careful. What do we have to be careful about? Theta can't be zero. Or the h of theta can't right. be zero. Right. So as long as theta is not zero or 90, we're fine. So as h of theta does not equal 0, we get a squared plus b squared is c squared. And there's the Pythagorean formula. It falls out from dimensions. And the Pythagorean formula is fundamentally a statement about adding areas. And so when you're looking at the different possible relationships you could have between the sides of the triangle, if you start to know units, different things are possible, different things are not possible. So what I want to do now is I want to list some possible formulas and you can tell me which ones do you think are reasonable and which ones do you think have no chance. So a cubed <coughs> plus b cubed equals 2c squared. Could this have been the Pythagorean formula? No, why not? Dimensions don't work. This is a volume. This is an area. The dimensions are wrong. So when I'm trying to look at the possible relationships between quantities, I know I'm not going to get something of this form. What about a squared minus b squared equals c squared? Is that possible? Could be negative. Right. So you've got to be very careful. So here I'm having A and B are my legs, okay. and C is my hypotenuse. And then again, we've got to be very careful. Is A the longest leg? Is A the shortest leg? Is A an arbitrary leg? If you start putting stuff like that in, you've got to be, that's very different than just saying, I take two legs. And so in, in all the stuff we're doing, we shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the legs. Um, another fun one. Correct. Different, and then you can, suck, and you can use this to then lead into different you know, conic sections. 
you know, what are the relationships between various things? Uh, what about a squared <coughs> plus 2b squared equals c squared? Yeah, the units work. Is this possible? So this is asymmetric. Well, don't, don't think so much about the h of theta right now, but just think that this is asymmetric. If I flip the roles of a and b, that shouldn't change the area. And so over here, unless I start saying a is the smaller one, and then I could maybe start doing, you know, this gets more subtle, maybe some kind of continuity argument as a approaches b, you know, all hell breaks loose. You know, in terms of what's happening here. But there's a little bit of an asymmetry here between A and B now. And do you expect your final formula to be symmetric? You know, I don't really expect to see a difference between A and B in my expression. And so when I'm just trying to see what kind of relationship I would expect between the sides, most students are not going to be working too much professionally with the Pythagorean formula. But they're going to have complicated things that they're dealing with. And so one of my favorite stories to tell is one of my uh, students from Brown, not surprisingly, went off into finance. And at one point, their company was about to do a major investment. And you know, he was just looking, and things just didn't look right. And you know, he looked at it a little bit more carefully, and eventually he found that they had a sign error somewhere. And their strategy was a little bit off. But you want to be able to look at things and see, is this reasonable? My favorite story along these lines is almost surely false, but I love telling it. So, they were trying to design the stealth fighter stealth bomber. And so in calculus, one of the things you do is you use the derivative to find maximum and minima. And they didn't check to see did they have a maximum or a minimum. So rather than reaching the point of maximum stealthiness, they built the I'm here plane. <laughs> now again, almost surely this is not true. I don't think they really built the I'm here plane. But you know, it's a nice way to illustrate the dangers of you know, not checking what you're doing. Can you look at your answer and see roughly, does this look reasonable? Yes? Um, the point that I make to my students all the time, I'm like, you should be able to not look at your answer and say, uh-oh, i got to go back and change something right. or that could be the answer. Right. It's when they, you say, can I have half of something in your answer bigger? Ah, but they don't do that. Right. They always just put the unknown alone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because they don't think about what the letters are even saying or So at least one of those two is not reasonable for a, for the relationship between sides of a triangle. So why is the second one bad? So you know, the more math you know, the better you can do in terms of checking things. So, so if I look, well, if I look at this as a plus b squared plus two ab equals c squared, because this is going to be a squared plus two ab plus b squared. Well, I know in a triangle, if you add any two sides together, it has to be greater than the third. And you know, the simplest way to see that is if I have two sides, like here, and their sum is less than the third side, there's no way to swing this down and have them meet up. And so here, this is too big. So if I'm trying to figure out what, what number can I put in here, I shouldn't be able to put in anything more than a two. So again, this is trying to take something and push it up to see you know, all the different levels you can go from you know, high school all the way up to college, looking at formulas and trying to get a sense of which formula might be reasonable. If people want, I have another example of trying to see you know, which formulas are reasonable by looking at winning percentages in baseball. Yes. 
Okay, so again, first loud voice wins. So you know, this is one of the hardest things for students is you know, sniffing out relationships. And so you have some data, you have some conjectured relationship. So imagine we have two teams. Uh, team A, they win P percent of their games, and Team B wins Q percent of their games. So A wins P percent of the time, B wins Q percent of the time. Are they playing against each other? And now they're playing against each other. Those previous percentages are not playing against each other. No, these are just overall throughout the season A has won P percent of their games, B has won Q percent, and now they're playing each other, and we want to see who's going to win. And so we want the probability A beats B. And here are some possibilities. P plus PQ over P plus Q plus 2PQ. P minus PQ over P plus Q plus 2PQ. P min uh, sorry, plus PQ over P plus Q minus 2PQ, and P minus PQ over P plus Q minus 2PQ. All right, so here are four possibilities for the probability that A beats B. It's the one where they should all be minuses. Okay, what makes you go for that one? Ah. <laughs> when you factor out in the, that fourth one you wrote, mm -hmm. when you factor out the Qs from the top, right. and you factor out the Qs from the, um, you have to break up that 2PQ into one of them goes with the P and one yep. goes with the Q, and then you factor, and then everything becomes P times 1 minus Q. <coughs> And after, you do the, and, after, and after you do a lot of algebra, excellent, you'll get um, 1 then, minus p. No, oh, no, sorry. Q times 1 minus p, and then you can always see the win lose. Oh, yeah, I was just writing, I was writing as 1 minus p times q. Yes. And there's, you know, there's an interpretation behind this. But if you don't see that interpretation, what could you do to start getting some idea of which of the four formulas? I'm trying to find how, you know, how to do this so that so we keep the whole thing in here. What can you do? <laughs> See, technology is wonderful. Um, I know. <laughs> you could play like you know football and toss this around. And what could you do to try to see which of the four formulas is correct? So imagine you give this to your students. How would you get a feel for which one is right without doing the algebra, without seeing what they represent? Stop playing. playing. Okay, what's the first example you might choose? 50-50. So let's say A wins half of its games and B wins half of their games and they play each other. What should the probability that A beats B? 50-50. So which of these would not be 50-50? So would they all be 50-50? So if I take P, so if I, so this becomes a half plus a fourth is three-fourths. So the first one we would get three-fourths and then down below one Half plus one half is one. Uh, we have one fourth, so we have one half over here. We would have three halves, right? And three fourths over three halves. It's one half. So this is still in the running. But let's look at let's look at this one down here. So if we look at this one, we now get one half plus one half minus a half. So now we get one half down below. And so we now get A's probability of winning is three halves or 150%. <laughs> so we can immediately eliminate this one. This feels the test of what happens if the two winning percentages are 50-50. So to me, this is the type of analysis I really want my students to learn is how can you look at something new and get a sense of what are the possible answers. So I don't want to go through all the different algebra. I just want to talk about some things you could check. So one thing you could check is the two teams both win 50% of their games. 
What else could you check? It's very similar to they both win 50% of their games. They both win. Oh, okay, well, okay. So that, that's something different. We'll, 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 we'll get to that in a second. But instead of both winning 50%, they both win. 100% is too extreme. This is the irresistible force and the immovable object. I'm sorry? Good. So if A wins 25% of their games and B wins 25% of their games, what's the probability A beats B? 50-50. The two teams equally suck. It's a technical word. <laughs> right? They're both winning 25% of their games. They both stink. If they play each other, this is the ultra shaman toilet bowl, you know, we would expect 50%. So if P equals Q, it should be 50%. So now that's a great thing to look at here. Which of these formulas reduces to 50% when P equals Q? So we look for P equals Q. That's a great thing to try. And that should always give 50%. Which is the first example, too. I mean, and which is the first, so the, right. So the first example when P equals Q will be in play for a long time. Now you had the great idea, Mark, I think, was you to look at a team that wins 100% of their games. Yeah. So if A wins 100% of their games and B wins less than 100% of their games, what's the probability A beats B? It should be 100%. Yeah, because A always wins. Because A always wins. So which of these will reduce to, you know, A wins 100% of the time. And so if P equals 1, we get 1 minus Q. We get 1 minus Q plus 1 minus P times Q. All right, because P is now 1. Oh, if P is 1, then that's 0. And we get 1. So this does reduce to 1 if uh, P equals 1 and Q is something less than 1. What if P equals 1 and Q equals 1? What do you expect the answer to be? Well, that's the P equals Q. This maybe is the P equals Q. Maybe you take the limit, and you know, for those of you who are teaching calculus or teaching upper level math, this is a great way to start talking about limits. You know, as somebody gets better and better and better, how do you think the answer is going to change? You know, things will blow up. Uh, when my brother was young, he and one of his friends were playing one of the old baseball games on the computer, and you could create your own players. And so to have fun, they created the ultimate pitcher who always struck everybody out. And they created the ultimate hitter who always got a home run. And they had the two face off. What happens? <laughs> so it, it, it was noticeable. It was like several minutes where the computer was just churning away. And the computer was just trying to calculate, what do I do? And finally, the computer came up with the only sensible solution. I'm sorry, no, not a walk. Rain delay. <laughs> somebody always gets a home run. Somebody always gets everybody out. What's At some point, the percentages, I mean, if both of these guys always win up to that point, when they play each other, somebody has to lose. <laughs> what the computer decided to do is give the guy a double. <laughs> is the home run is always four bases. A strikeout is always zero bases, so we'll give you the average, we'll give you two bases. Ground will double. Ground will double. But in the stimulus, the denominator goes to zero first. Well, now you have some games as to how these things are going. Other things you can look at is if P is greater than Q, what can you say about A's chance of winning? More than half. More than half. What if you have the following? And so you, you start looking for different relations. Um, P is greater than a half is greater than Q. What's the chance that A wins? What can you tell me about the chance that A wins? It's more than a half, but you can be more specific than more than a half. Can't be that specific without knowing the numbers. <laughs> But so A wins P percent of their games, which is you know, greater than a half. B loses Q, you know, wins Q percent of their games, which is less than a half. A is an above average team, and they're playing a below average team. What do you think A's winning percentage is? It's higher than its average. Against average teams, A wins P percent of the time. Now A is playing a below average team. You know, for those of you who watch college football, this is one of the fluff games to make teams eligible for the playoffs, for the college bowls. 
And so you would now expect that your team would win more than P% percent of the games. So whatever answer you have, in a special case like this, you have some idea of the functional form of your answer. And you know, again, I love problems like this of trying to get students, what do you think your answer should look like? What are the key features? And you don't have to give them the formulas. You can just say, write down, you know, I want some expression involving P and Q. What kind of properties do you think it should satisfy? Well, I think that if the teams are equal, it better spit out 50%. If A is a better team than B, it better be more than 50%. If A is better than average and B is below average, you can then maybe think about, well, what if I switch the roles of P and Q? You know, what should that do to the answer? In, in terms of proving why the last formula works, I'll give you a quick rough sketch as to why this works. And I've actually done a lot of work with baseball mathematics. I actually have an email. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention the company, but there's a major consulting firm that I've sent many students to, and they're interested in getting involved in baseball mathematics. It is a wonderful, exciting field. I wish a lot of major league ball clubs were more interested in theory. They are quite fine most of the time with just regression. But as a Red Sox fan, if you can win three World Series in a 10-year stretch, that's fine with me. <laughs> so we will assume that two things happen. A has a good day. A has a bad day. What's the probability A has a good day? P. P. What's the probability A has a bad day? One minus, One minus P. Now at this point, now it's B's turn. B has good day. B teams has bad day. What's the probability B has a good day? No. No, A can have a good day and B could have a good day. Q. And what's the probability B has a bad day? And then over here, again, I'm going to just go B good because people want to have food, B bad, and this will be Q and 1 minus Q. So if A has a good day and B has a good day, what happens? But what happens? What happens? Tie. So we have to keep playing. Extra innings. Okay? Undetermined outcome. What happens if A has a good day and B has a bad day? A wins. So here, this is an A wins, and this is P times 1 minus Q. What if A has a bad day and B has a good B wins. And this will be now, well, I prefer to write it as 1 minus P times Q, because I'm, right. And I do think it matters the order in which you write things. And now if both of them have a bad day, we keep playing. So in all of this, you know, these two outcomes, they always recycle again and we keep going. So if you look at the fraction of the time that A wins, A wins P 1 minus Q out of P 1 minus Q plus 1 minus P Q. And this goes back to what you were saying. How you formulate the algebra makes a huge difference in terms of how you process things. And you know, we are all expert at writing questions for kids where if we want them to get the problem right, we will phrase things in certain ways to get them thinking about things in certain ways. And if we don't want them to get it right, we will phrase it in another way. <laughs> And so, you know, depending on what score I want my students to get, I can easily, oh, this is being recorded. So this is the same as P minus PQ over P plus Q minus 2PQ. But when I look at this, this is screaming at me certain things in probability. This is not screaming anything to me. And so how we present information is extremely important. And so, you know, why do we care about all these algebra rules? You know, one of the things, why do we care about all this simplification? Why do we care? Sometimes it's bad to simplify. Sometimes it's better to leave things a little bit more expansive because it gives you an idea of where things are coming from. 
And so, you know, to me, you know, part of this was trying to give you modules that you can use in your classes. So if I am completely feeling in the first half of today, it's only the first half of today, there's still, you know, three more halves. Mm -hmm. I'm a little scared that your hand went up so quickly when I was talking about feeling. I, well, I've actually come up with that problem in my class with my students because of the way we present. Excellent. Always simplify, always change. So sometimes it's better to have the improper fraction. Yes. Sometimes it's better to have the mixed number. Right. I know. The only hard and fast rule is that there are no hard and fast rules. <laughs> I know th this is the problem: is we're not training them to be machines and to just you know crank things out. Is we're trying to train you to understand the local situations, and depending on the problem, it's sometimes better to write things one way rather than another. Uh, here's one of my favorite examples, and this leads to one of the big steps in the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'm going to give you an algebra problem. First one to get it gets the very first M&M after lunch. <laughs> uh, second person gets the second M&M. <laughs> the... All right. You ready? And the answer is? Minus not minus 2. Nine, 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 zero. Yes. 99990. Nine, 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 but you did one number wrong. Oh, did I do one number wrong? Yeah. The, 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 under the 880. Yeah. Oh, this should be? Yes. Yes, thank you. You got ahead of yourself. Got ahead of myself. And so for this problem, you know, the key thing to note is you don't want to do the problem as given. You want to rearrange, and you want to go down like this. That when you regroup, you can do far better in this problem. And so this is one of the hardest concepts. I mean, in something like this, it's screaming at you, regroup me, regroup me, regroup me. Um, after lunch, I'll give you two different proofs of the geometric series formula. And you're know, counting in some applications of this from gambling and probability in terms of how you group terms, how this is useful. But, yes? Do you think, um, going back to your proof of the, the one in the corner there? Yes. The one that you did, that was kind of the simpler way to do it, would that be safe to say that it was kind of like an indirect proof? Because you're kind of going through testing and assuming, you assume that these are the formula and then you're testing it out. Oh, for the four. Right. Right, so the problem is we don't actually know a priori that it has to be one of these four formulas. It's just you can say after you know, spending you know, $10 million, the you know, New York Yankees Red Sox Consortium has decided that this is the formula that correctly models a team's winning percentage. Or probably wouldn't be Red Sox because it would probably be Las Vegas. You know, they're trying to figure out how to set the line. And so Las Vegas has done some research. They had reason to believe that something of this form worked. And if you think about what we went to the very beginning, what was the first thing we did today? We did number bonds, and we looked at it was linear, then it was quadratic. Can we guess the quadratic? Well, if we know a couple of values, we can then use this to fill in the values of the other places. And so maybe we have some reason to believe it's you know, some kind of quadratics, and we have different cross terms. And then if you look at what's going on here, you have your linear terms, your quadratic terms, you have your different functional forms a ratio of them, it's not so unreasonable to suspect something along those lines might work. And I, I have the numerator a lot sketchier you know, than the denominator, but the more general piece might be um, A1P plus A2Q plus A3PQ over B1P plus B2Q plus B3PQ, but also I've got a4p squared, and then I think a5q squared, plus b4p squared, plus b5q squared. Maybe I have some reason to believe that this is the formula to predict how well a team is going to do. And now I need to figure out what the values are of these 
This is what statistics does all the time. They'll do regression, they'll do some kind of estimation to figure out what are the optimal values of these coefficients. Can you find then maybe some theoretical justification for this, that not only does the formula work for the data you have, but the formula will keep on working? And so you know, the question is always, you know, depending on the background of your students, how far can you go with them? You know, with you know, kindergarten kids, you're not going to get you know, to this level. But can you start getting them to you know, start questioning and thinking about strategy? What are the different possibilities? So you talk about that baseball now. So wasn't that the idea behind that movie? Oh, Moneyball? Yeah. So, so I'm going to just hit stop right now so I can talk. <laughs>